Lewis Cartania. Good. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. We'll call the meeting to order. Welcome to the Maryland Health Care Commission meeting, April 17th. On the phone, uh, we have uh, Chairman Tanio. Are you there? I am. Can you hear me? Yes. And Dr. Okay. Peralta? Commissioner Peralta may pick up uh, soon. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to introduce uh, a new commissioner. We have with us uh, today Michael McHale, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Hospice of Chesapeake Hospice of the Chesapeake HOC, and it serves patients in Anne Arundel and Prince George counties. Under Michael's leadership, HOC has launched many innovative programs, including a pediatric program and recently the Chesapeake Palliative Medicine Program. Prior to joining HS HOC, Commissioner McHale was in senior management at the Washington Home and Community Hospice and at several large nonprofit hospices in Michigan and Southern California. Commissioner McHale holds a master's degree in healthcare administration and a bachelor's in political science. Please join me in welcoming Michael McHale, Commissioner. Would you like to say a few words, sir? Welcome. Our first item is approval of minutes in your packets with copies of the minutes from the March 20th meeting. Uh, if there are no changes or corrections, I'd entertain a motion for approval. A motion. Is there a second? Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Minutes approved. Okay. Agenda item number one. Um, you have all received the written updates from our centers. Uh, ben, do you have any updates in addition to that? So. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the uh, commission. Very briefly, I wanted to uh, update you on activities related to the Maryland Health Benefit uh, Exchange, the Maryland Health Connection. As you know, the uh, executive director of the Maryland Healthcare Commission is on the board of the Maryland Health Benefit Exchange. Uh, after a rocky start, I think that everyone I uh, was very pleased that at the end of the open season period, approximately 313,000 Marylanders had uh, acquired health care coverage either through a Medicaid MCO or a qualified health plan. Uh, what was particularly uh, impressive, I think, was that from a start of about 10,000 at the 1st of January, over 60,000 Marylanders had uh, gained enrollment in a qualified health plan, which was, I think, far beyond anyone's expectation given the rocky start. All that said, the infrastructure, I think everyone agrees, uh, failed the residents. 
uh, and at a meeting on April 1st, the exchange board uh, voted uh, to move to adopt the infrastructure used in uh, Connecticut. Over the next uh, six months, the uh, exchange will transition uh, to the Merrill or the Connecticut infrastructure. Uh, that's uh, systems that have been developed by uh, Deloitte and has gotten uh, very high marks uh, among the state uh, exchanges nationally. Uh, there will be some compromises, including the uh, fact that we'll pretty much take what uh, was developed for Connecticut as is. Of course, logos and uh, Maryland specific requirements will be uh, modified, but uh, significant enhancements beyond the capabilities that existed in Connecticut for 2014 probably can't be accomplished, uh, given the fact that there's only six months uh, between the end of this open season and the next open season uh, in November. So it will be a daunting cha a task. There will be, will be uh, a period of time uh, over the next six months uh, when both infrastructures are going to have to be maintained by the exchange, the current, the current uh, systems for uh, life-changing events uh, will have to have to support uh, enrollment. Uh, Medicaid enrollment will be supported through the existing infrastructure. Then approximately November 1st, uh, that infrastructure will be brought down and the new um, the Deloitte system will be brought up ready for the start of open enrollment uh, beginning in uh, November 15th. So it's going to be uh, challenging it will, because of the uh, the types of errors in the system, it's going to be necessary that people who have enrolled in 2014 to re-enter their information in for the 2015 period, uh, which is, uh, I think, we hope will be more seamless, but will nevertheless mean some folks would have to enter some of their the information again. But I think given the fears and concerns about the quality of information in the existing system, this is the best uh, way forward. Uh, one of the limitations of the Connecticut system is that uh, it doesn't have an embedded small group product, the shop product. Uh, you know that the exchange has uh, struggled with that for the last uh, year and a half, really. And small group is a certainly something that has been very uh, important to the Maryland Health Care Commission. Uh, the strategy for the small group product is that uh, the exchange intends to uh, issue an RFP for basically an independent developer to develop a shop application that would be ready for the new open season uh, in November of next year. Uh, an RFP will be on the street uh, shortly. Uh, they uh, have the exchange has sought assistance from audacious inquiry to uh, develop that RFP and a award would be uh, made for a successful vendor sometime. Uh, in the late spring or early summer, and on a relatively rapid uh, pace, they would have to develop the application so that small employers could uh, could uh, enroll through a shop product. As you know, uh, the big advantage with shop is that, uh, unlike in the private market, there could you could introduce an employee choice model. Uh, typically, in small group, today you have employer choice, where the employer picks the uh, plan that's available. Uh, through the exchange, it is feasible that uh, you could develop a framework in which a number of plans could be offered uh, theoretically at the same metal level, and the employee then could opt for the plan that best met their needs. Uh, that's the value add in shop, and that's something that uh, Maryland just up to this point have not been able to take advantage of. In light of that, uh, of what's happening in shop, we have opted uh, to close our uh, state, uh, small state subsidy program uh, on uh, June 1 of this year. Uh, as you know, for the last three and a half years, we've kept this program, we've ha operated this program for the last six months. We've kept it going uh, when we had intended to close it down because shop would roll in. Uh, we will close that down in June of this year, uh, and individual employers that will opt to to enroll after that point, will be able to enroll through a private in, private insurer, but they will be able to qualify for the subsidies associated with the ACA. That's up to a 50% premium subsidy 
uh, if their average income qualifies, average uh, wage qualifies them for those subsidies. So although SHOP won't be uh, in operation until November, the federal government has allowed uh, states to offer subsidies uh, even when employers contract directly with uh, qualified health plans. So that, that means that uh, we can, we can uh, close our program. It's going to be especially beneficial to the uh, insurers who have agreed to keep this going after we told them, at least on three occasions, that we would, uh, we would halt it due to the availability of, of the shop uh, programs. Uh, what it's meant to them is they've had to keep uh, personnel active on our program even as they migrated to other programs. Uh, we've been uh, in issued guidance to uh, employers and brokers indicating that this program is going to cease uh, and we, uh, we expect that many will have opportunities to qualify for the federal subsidies or alternatively in some cases they'll be able to direct their employees to the individual exchange where they, those employees as they are uh, largely <coughs> low income employees could qualify for substantial subsidies. As uh, in cases where they would be not offering coverage at small employers, because those are life-changing events, uh, and even though open season is closed, those life-changing events would enable people to uh, enroll in the individual plan. So I don't. There will be opportunities for migration to effective uh, uh, plans, uh, even with the closure of our program. Okay, thank you, Ben. Uh, David Sharp, our Director for the Center of Health Information Technology and Innovative Care Delivery, will provide an overview of the strategic plan for telemedicine. David. So, uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. Um, it's my pleasure to be here before you today to <coughs> provide you with an update um, from the feedback we received from the March 20th Commission meeting. If you'll recall, staff facilitated a panel presentation to review the strategic plan for telehealth. The panel discussed the work of the 2014 Telemedicine Task Force Advisory Group, three specifically, clinical, finance and business model, and technology solutions and standards. In your meeting materials is a slide deck that details the enhancement requested by the commission and staff action to the definition of telehealth and the proposed use cases and future use cases. The commission also requested staff explore a telehealth use case pilot. I'm pleased to report that on April 10th, staff posted on eMaryland Marketplace a bid board for an innovative telehealth use case pilot that will use technology to improve transitions of care between a long-term care facility and a acute care hospital in Maryland. The pilot, will, the pilot will use telehealth technology and assess its effects on long-term care discharges to acute care hospitals and hospital readmissions. Included in the pilot will be an evaluation of the impact of telehealth on select clinical quality measures. The bid board is up to posted up to $25,000 with a one-to-one -one financial match, where a maximum of 5% of the match can be used for in-kind hours. Pilot participants must include a, the state design, a state designated MSO, acute care hospital, a telehealth technology vendor, Chris, and a long-term care facility that has fully implemented EHRs and is participating with Chris. Responses to the bid board are due on April 25th. Staff anticipates the pilot to begin in May with preliminary findings available in the fall. The staff plans to include the preliminary findings of the pilot in the final telehealth task force report due to the Governor, Senate Finance Committee, and the House Health and Government Operations Committee by December 1st, 2014. A more detailed uh, report from the pilot will be available next year. Commissioners, this concludes my addition to the update. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for David? <clears throat> yeah. Fran. Thank you, David. And thank you and, um, and your colleagues for taking, uh, taking some serious consideration of the input that we gave you last, last, um, last time. I have a a question specifically about the pilot. Is the intention to, to ask the proposers to present um, the use case with regard to a specific patient population or a specific clinical condition that would be, would be tested in this pilot um, rather than, it doesn't, it doesn't appear as if that's being called for in the RFP. 
Yeah, that's a great question, Commissioner Phillips. We did not drill down to the specific detail of the, uh, the whether the, the patient population or the quality measures. We'd heard from um, the industry that there are a lot of different ideas around the approach. So we thought it'd be best to see what ideas might emerge by having some guiding direction, but not pinpointing with particular precision on those measures. Okay. Thank you, David. We appreciate it. Dr. Peralta, hi, did you yes, have a question? Yes, hi. I do have a question. Thank you for the opportunity. And I would like to uh, follow up on the pilot. And if I recall correctly, in the last uh, meeting, we talked about uh, recommending the pilot to be extended also to primary care settings. And I'm wondering if there was any deliberation about that. Um, thank you, Dr. Peralta, for the question. Um, in, we had looked for an opportunity to launch a pilot somewhat quickly using feedback uh, Commissioner Barr and others around the room had provided us. Um, it could easily, we could easily have pilots that extend to primary care and in other directions as well. Um, we chose this because of the speed of trying to stand it up and the, um, and the limitations we had around the budget. So um, we are sort of um, somewhat um, limited at this point, but we could do other pilots um, if we can find additional funding, uh, perhaps um, as we get into fiscal year 15. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you David. Uh, Teresa Leo, Director of the Center of Quality Measurement and Reporting, will provide an update now on Maryland's results in the National State Healthcare Associated Infection Progress Report. Teresa. Thank you. Good afternoon, Commissioner. What I'd like to do today is just update you on a CDC report that was released last month. You'll see the colorful document it should be in front of you. Um, this report is the first time the CDC released a report that identified or summarized state performance on a number of HAI metrics. Uh, the first you'll see there is CLABSI, and it shows that in Maryland there was a 45% decrease since um, uh, 2008. And that's pretty much consistent with what we have found um, in reporting this, because we do require Maryland hospitals to report on CLAPSI to us. Um, the second, which is a CAUTI measure, is a measure that um, hospitals across the country are required to report for the um, by CMS for the inpatient um, prospective payment system under the ICU inpatient quality reporting system. Um, but we have not required it. We did not require it at this time. So for that, for the quality um, information you see there, it represents 38 hospitals and not all of our 46 uh, acute care hospitals. And in terms of the number of hospitals that perform worse than the national experience on the SIR, there are really only seven hospitals that fall into that category. So I just wanted to make sure that um, if, if you also saw this information from another um, another source that you had a, a, an idea of how our um, information differs from other states. Um, in terms of the SSI and the um, SSI for abdominal hysterectomy and colon surgery, these again are two, um, were two um, metrics that we were not, uh, information that we were not collecting for these metrics. We began with hip, knee, and cabbage procedures with respect to uh, surgical site infections. We've now added effective January of 2014 um, colon and abdominal hysterectomy procedures as well. So we'll be able to get a better picture of what's going on in Maryland. Um, we have reached out to CDC to ask if they could um, report only the class C because we think that's a fair representation of the state. Um, but um, of course, they uh, denied the request. But you should also know that there is a lot of work being done now um, in terms of CAUTI prevention. MHA has a collaborative that they put in place actually in 2011, and we believe that those, um, most of those 38 hospitals were participating voluntarily in that collaborative, and again, perhaps participating with one unit or one ICU <coughs> unit, but there's no way for us to tell because we weren't collecting or requiring that from hospitals at the time, so we don't have access to that, that data. So um, know that we are looking at it. We're now collecting all of that information, and going forward, we'll be able to compare ourselves more fairly with the rest of the country. Are there any questions? Yes, Dr. Borg. 
Thanks for the report. It, it's kind of interesting that the things that you weren't measuring here, we weren't measuring here in Maryland, the ones we did worse on. So the, the question is, is what measures matter? Do people just paying attention to the measures? Um, and if so, I mean, I know you can't tell these, that from these data, but it sort of implies that they're, they're focusing on the things that we are measuring and perhaps not focusing on the things that we are not measuring. And I think um, in Maryland, we utilize a, a, uh, an advisory committee to help guide us in terms of what measures we should collect. We started with Class B well before it was required by CMS. And you've seen that we've done quite a bit in terms of reducing the Class B rate. So that really has worked effectively. And then we moved to, um, toward the um, healthcare worker uh, flu influ influenza vaccination rate. And we focused on that. And we've made a lot of progress in that area. And then um, the surgical site infections for the, as I said, the hip, knee, and cabbage. Um, but CAUTI was uh, brought up some time ago before our committee. And we made a decision to not go with CAUTI at the time and to move forward with some of the other the procedures. So um, as I said, as of January 14, we are on par with the rest of the country. We're collecting the same information. And we'll be able to address that. So. Yeah. Well, and it's been said said many times here before, you know, I think the hospital industry would do well to have more indicators measured because what gets measured and, and is publicized does get improved. And all they have to do is look at the model of nursing home industry, which has dozens of quality indicator measures that have all improved in the last 10 years through that. Tracy, well, knows that much more than I do. So. Thank you. Any other questions for Tracy? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Agenda item number three is an CMS's release of practitioner and supplier payment information and MHCC's possible responses. Linda Bartniski, Director of Center for Analysis and Information Systems, and her team will provide an update on the potential for releasing information on healthcare services provided to the privately insured by healthcare practitioners. Great. Want to come up? Yeah. Hi, my name is Kennedy. Kennedy H. Trotman. Kenny H. Trotman, better known as. And I've been working at Chair First uh, for the last seven years as a senior actual analyst. And I'm very excited to be here at the MACC. Thank you. We're, we're excited to have you. Welcome. Thank you very much. agenda today. We'll try to keep this um, brief. It's just going to um, be like an appetizer. Uh, last week, CMS made public the most detailed data ever released in Medicare's 50-year history. The data contained information about how many tests were ordered and procedures performed for every provider who received Medicare payments under Part B, which excludes payments to hospitals and other institutions. <coughs> Excuse me. The data includes not only counts of procedures and patients, but also the total payments made by Medicare to each provider for each procedure during 2012. The release of the payment information reflects the new dynamics surrounding healthcare information. Payments to individual doctors have historically been shrouded in secrecy. For decades, the American Medical Association and others blocked the release of the information citing privacy concerns and the potential for misuse of the information. But a federal judge ruled last year that the information could be made public, and the AMA did not challenge the ruling. During this past week, center staff studied the Medicare data release and developed a comparable data set of procedure and payment information for healthcare professionals from the privately insured medical care database for Maryland residents. Additionally, staff developed an application to display information from both the privately insured and the Medicare data set uh, for each provider in one window. We have uh, a number of data validation issues to resolve before we're ready to go public with the application. But we wanted to demonstrate the application for you today so that you might provide us with some comments on the best way to present the information. And once we've resolved our data issues, we'll let you know, and we'll give you all an opportunity to uh, play with the information. Uh, to that end, Leslie Lebrecht, 
who developed the application will uh, demonstrate it for you. Okay, so um, okay, thanks. So um, just to give you our starting point, um, and so you can see what um, the New York Times presented on the Medicare data. I'm going to take a sample here. This is on the New York Times website. Uh, Dr. Simpler is an uh, internal medicine, a uh, primary care practitioner, and um, as you can see, you see the number of patients, the number of uh, services provided, the average billed amount, and the average reimbursed amount from Medicare. Um, so this was our model. And um, we, um, how do I get to the next screen? Oh, okay. All right, so we wanted to start there and give a comparable um, sort of look and feel to the application. And I'd just like to say before um, anything that this was truly a team effort um, between me and Srinivas Sridhara and Paula Henning. And this morning, uh, Ms. Gemini Shaw pinch hit for us on some formatting issues. Thank you, Gemini. Mm -hmm. So um, I will start again with Ms. Simpler. Mm -hmm. simpler. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I can't see that far. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and uh, so you, you see what kind of presentation we get. And um, Leslie, maybe you could uh, get the scroll up and, and uh, make it a little bigger. We can't see it. OK. Uh, how do I scroll, make control. it control? Scroll. Oh, control. I'm not supposed scroll to button. hit the scroll button on this. All right. I was instructed there not to do that. Is that any better? Yeah. Okay. All right. So um, just for comparison, let's look at some different let's, things. Before you go there. So uh, in terms of what you saw before, you saw uh, from the Medicare site or the Times site, which was using Medicare data, uh, what the staff has done here is taken the APC data from 2012 and summarized it by provider, by MPI, uh, and procedure code, uh, and uh, <clears throat> constructed comparable private uh, carrier information, uh, number of services, number of patients, uh, average payment, uh, patient liability, which is meaningful uh, in the private sector less so in Medicare, and they didn't publish it. Uh, and what I think this shows is you can get a sense, uh, perhaps if you're not looking necessarily at primary care, but other specialists, what the frequency, the volume of services uh, provided by an individual uh, physician or nurse practitioner, podiatrist, clinical social worker, uh, the mix of services that that individual clinician provided. Uh, and uh, perhaps if you select several, you can make some judgments on the uh, volume and uh, frequency for which some services are provided. Uh, you can also see uh, uh, something about what your liabilities would be on average if you're insured by a private carrier. So go ahead, Le Leslie. Uh, I'm just letting it rip here. Um, so as you can see, um, you can do any combination of name, specialty, and zip code. Um, if I put in the 21287, which is the Hopkins campus, brings in many, many specialties. Um, 
Here's the nurse practitioner, which is also a selection in the specialty um, columns. Uh, you can see what the payments were. We uh, are able to calculate total yeah. payment, but we we're not going to do we're not going to present that information until we've done quite a bit of validation um, because that's a very sensitive field. And I want to point out that um, you know many providers are salaried and work for institutions, and so often the payment, even though attributed to their NPI, actually goes to the institution or the practice and uh, not to the individual doctor. Provider. Right. So we've included that little caveat note on the page, but you may uh, you may think of other caveats that you think should also appear on the page. So um, that's pretty much right. So. You, I think uh, one of the other questions we had was sort of how do you group the information? Um, originally, we had thought we would do all the private and then group all the Medicare. But uh, if, a, if a person wants to actually know how many surgeries someone has done, so on the first row is that cater cataract surgery, uh, you can see that they, there was a total of um, 13 plus 19. So you can see how many were performed. You have to do a little mental math. But by having them next to each other, you can see that. You can see how many unique patients the person treated. So particularly if you're interested in a service where volume is linked to higher quality, it gives you an opportunity to do that and to compare them. And, uh, and as Leslie said, there are nurse practitioners in the data, so you can look up all manner of people. And uh, once we have the the data vetted, we will let you know and uh, so and give you a link so that you can explore it and give us some feedback on what you think it should look like when it becomes public. So could we could we since we're going to be considering cardiology issues later, could you uh, pull up a cardiologist as an example? Uh, okay. Okay. Doctor. Uh, you could try uh, Dr. There's, there's a third one down in cardiology. Oh, thank you. There we go. I'm not sure I'm not sure that's an interventionist, but if you scroll into the services. That's it. There, those are the three. Let me pull up uh, cardiology as a selection. I might get more. Okay. <laughs> okay, here you go. So do we see any stents? I, I'm, uh, There's 90, uh, 9980. So one idea is if you're really thinking about uh, how this might be used in terms of looking at uh, how experienced your provider is, uh, you would have a feature in this not operational yet that would allow you to search by a procedure or a range of procedures and, and instead of being Provider-centric, you would have procedure-centric, and would show you everyone that had done this. Or uh, more commonly, uh, many times, young families shop for a, an OB, uh, and we may be curious as to how frequently uh, that individual uh, has uh, deliveries and C-sections, or what the ratio is. And so, it it started out from Medicare as being provider-centric, uh, and we think that there is some value in thinking of it in a more creative way, uh, allowing it to, to search by procedure going forward. So we'll be you know, thinking of that uh, and getting some, looking for some input and thoughts from you. I think, first off, does it have any uh, value? Uh, uh, the staff obviously has a position, but commissioners uh, might have differing perspectives. Yeah. One question that I yeah. have, I think the value is great, because I think it begins have a picture of healthcare that we've never seen before. But I guess one concern that I have with the data in either extrapolating the procedures or looking at by provider centric is going back to something you said earlier, which has been a controversy in the news, is that oftentimes the person who is actually being is the billing exit out 
is not the person who's providing the care. Um, people bill uh, uh, subsequent to a physician because bill they bill at 100 percent. The nurse practitioner does not, and that varies across the insurer. So it, it's a very it, it, and that's very common. So I don't know how we can really get at the answer to really say, has this person done a sufficient number of these? What is their pattern for this? Because you, you as a user of this data are going to have to understand how that workflow and how that is structured within a practice. And I would be concerned that we jump to conclusions without understanding how these practices have organized themselves. Um, it's Craig. Can I, can I comment? Yes. I think we have to think about the issues in two buckets. I think we have to think about the methodologic issues and getting it right. And then I think we need to think about the impact. And I think what struck me last week, um, and I was going back and forth with Farzad Mostashari as he was tweeting frantically over a 24-hour period of all these analyses that were being done. And if anybody followed this on Twitter, it was mm -hmm. just, uh, I mean, the, the news cycle was fast and furious around this, where there was a lot of misinterpretation of the data, a lot of incorrect, you know, uh, you know, accusations, and and so I think we just have to recognize that we're probably hitting an inflection point, which I think will ultimately be good. But I think for us to be relevant, we're going to have to both be accurate methodologically and be sort of seen as a um, you know, in our in our usual role as being the objective arbiter of, of this information. So I think we're going to also have to be a little more savvy around, you know, the the whole you know collaboration with other people and how to use this kind of information, and not just think that you know we're going to put it out and everybody's going to you know sort of directly do that. And what was very impressive is you know people didn't go to CMS for the for the data. Many people went to the New York Times instead and a lot of these other secondary outlets that we've been talking about before in having third parties be able to, to use the data. So I think we saw a little bit of it in action last week. Thank you. Uh, Glenn? I, I agree with everything that was said already, but I, I wonder if we can add Medicaid in here once we work all the other stuff out? Um, I think we could, except if you remember right now on the MCO data we don't have prices. So right. you're, we're but once those prices become available, then yes, I think it would make the perfect sense. Thanks, Sorry. So, Glenn, I had a side reaction of how we'd like to just pull up for a weekend and geek out on the data. <laughs> um, this is this is fascinating. Um, not everybody is going to be uh, have that reaction, and as was just mentioned, more people went to the New York Times. Um, one of the things that the federal government is really wrestling with is they've made a tremendous amount of data available to the public is that they're finding that people need context, they need interpretation. Um, and the other piece that I would add to that is thinking through the use cases. Um, so what is, what is the intended, well, let me start by saying I love the idea of making this public, I'll put it that way. Um, but I think it would be really helpful to and important to think through what is the intended use and that can therefore drive where we want to identify, um, describe the methodology that was used, what was done through validation to make sure the accuracy um, protects, frankly, um, the subjects of the data, but also the uh, integrity of the commission as well in, in releasing this information. Uh, what caveats, but then also that can give rise to different views that you might want to present in different ways to search and sort uh, to support particular use cases, whether it is about um, you know a family and, and somebody who wants who has an elective procedure coming up and they want to compare to find out who who does this at the most affordable rate. I mean, it's a really logical, practical question, and you probably could give some useful information if the data presentation were such that it could actually um, support that use case. So thinking through. How, how do you, you know, what are the different ways the data would likely be used in addition to the research, you know, geek out people, mm -hmm. um, it's a professional term, um, and, and that could in influence how you, how you go about this. But I think this is an excellent step forward. Okay, yes, Dr. Uh, <coughs> echo many.
many of the comments already, but I think the context one for me was the most important. Because this is great, I think, the transparency and the information available, but I think there are challenges in terms of just looking at volume and cost. And so utilizing quality data that we have to line up with the clinicians, I mean, the highest volume provider may not be the best quality. The lowest cost provider may certainly not be the best quality. The highest, you know, you, so, so we don't want people just going after the numbers if we can avoid it. So the quality metrics, um, coaching, benchmarking, how, how do other ophthalmologists in the community compare to the one you're looking at now? You know, and so there's so additional context. Uh, I think searching by procedure, elective, and so on. What health plan? I mean, we have these data. I'm, I know this is the start of something, but looking forward, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, what health plans does this clinician work in? Where, where are they? Tying all those things together, <laughs> what are the quality metrics in the hospitals that they participate and do their surgery in? All those things, the collapse rates, if it's, you know, you, that, that, if you, that's, that's... You don't want it all on one page, though, right? Well, no, no, no. <laughs> no, not all on one page, but if, if you yeah. really want an empowered patient, mm -hmm. consumer, family member, mm -hmm. that's what that's what we're going to get there. I know this is you know, two, three, five years down the road, but it starts with this, and we don't yeah. want to miss an opportunity to engage people, say, hey, keep coming back, because this is what we're doing. Uh, the other thing is, from a physician perspective, something the Medicare, I mean, you have to allow clinicians to comment or review their data, correct things that might be, in, you know, erroneous. And so I think Merrill Lynch could really set the stage for, for making, not making the mistakes that perhaps made at the, the first release. Okay, yes. One more question and we'll move Yeah, on. just a quick follow-on to that um, regarding the, um, the consumer use of this information. Research has shown that if you just provide financial information without the attending quality, the people will make the assumption that more expensive is better quality. So it's really important, not everybody, but generally. So it's really important to pair those, particularly if this is intended for a consumer audience. Um, and the other piece is I need to absolutely underscore what Dr. Barr was just saying about um, working with the effect or the subjects of this data so that they're not caught off guard, um, because that will, um, even if it's totally accurate and completely wonderful, you don't want to be dealing with people's surprise. And it, it, people don't like to be surprised. So you know, figuring out what is the strategy for making sure that folks are aware that this is coming out, that they have some preparation, even so far as talking points. Mm -hmm. When somebody picks up the phone and calls them and says, I see, blah, 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 what do they say? I mean, so there's, there's some really helpful things where you can bring people along to be collaborators on the release of this data as opposed to um, uh, agitated opponents, which we don't want to have, of course. Sure. Let, one yes. very brief okay. uh, comment. The, there's another use case in addition to what's really important and has been said about consumers, and that's uh, for local planning coalitions for public health purposes to look at this data from a population perspective. So look at the ability to, to map to geo coding on particular procedures as a proxy for the incidence of, of conditions or disorders in a defined population. Because I think that there's an awful lot that public health could glean uh, from aggregate use of that data. Leslie, Linda, I think you have some. I think we have. Thank you so much for your comments. You've given us lots yeah. to think about. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Item, uh, agenda item number four, <clears throat> state health plan for facilities and services, cardiac surgery and percutaneous coronary intervention services, the proposed permanent regulations. Eileen Fleck, our chief of acute care policy and planning, will present the proposed permanent regulations for the cardiac surgery and PCI services chapter. Eileen. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and Commissioner. Before requesting your approval of proposed regulations to replace Comar 1024-17, I want to review some of the comments that were received by staff on two previous drafts. So the first draft was posted in September of 2013, and then we looked at those comments, reviewed them, and put together a second draft that we gave to the Senate Finance Committee and the House Health and Government Operations Committee in November of 2013. And I want to, again, emphasize that it was the CAG, the Clinical Advisory Group's work that um, really shaped our recommendations in putting together these draft regulations. And due to the extensive amount of comments received, I can't cover all of them in this presentation, but 
<laughs> we have all day. It's okay. Yeah. I, I provided you with a very long memo with a good summary, I hope, of all those comments and our response to them. Um, so, you know, first I'm going to talk about the comments relevant to cardiac surgery, and then I'll focus on the ones that are relevant primarily to PCI services. In terms of the effective date on the first draft that we put out there, Anne Arundel Medical Center proposed that the standards should apply to the pending certificates of need. And then also the University of Maryland Medical System and Dimensions commented that um, we should clarify that the standards will be prospective and that data collection will be required only going forward. Um, staff is recommending that the regulation should not apply to pending projects. There are two projects for hospital relocations that would potentially be affected. And we don't think it would be fair or reasonable to change the review process on them sort of late in the game. In terms of the data collection, a notice is expected to be published in the Maryland Register tomorrow indicating that hospitals should provide their cardiac surgery data um, that they've been providing to the Society for Thoracic Surgeons database. And that data collection will be from beginning of the calendar year, but we're going to give them quite a bit of time to get us like the first six months of data. It won't be until the fall that they need to give us the data. And the data collection is authorized by existing statute, and so it's not dependent on these regulations um, at all. But we did, we did think it was important to get that information going back to the beginning of the year in terms of implementing these regulations. Um, what is that? It seems like something, like it's on slide 12. Oh, I just need a minute. Okay, so the numbering that I see up here is wrong, but it looks like it's just off by plus 10. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure how that happened because my printed copy looks fine. But, okay. <laughs> um, in terms of the health planning regions, um, there were a number of comments on that, on that first draft that we put out there. Um, some ideas were that we should have a fifth health planning region instead of just the four that we've proposed. And there were concerns about where Frederick County was assigned. Um, and so, you know, we think that the proposed regions do make sense and that they reflect the utilization patterns for Maryland residents. And then also, um, we want to emphasize that the health planning regions are mostly used for utilization forecasting and regulating the, part, the pace of cardiac surgery program development um, if a program has recently been approved, then there will be three years that will pass after it starts operating before we consider a new program so that that program has a chance to get up and running. In terms of um, the issues and policy section, um, Anne Arundel Medical Center and Johns Hopkins Medicine suggested that there should be more discussion of geographic access to cardiac surgery. Um, and so we did add some language to address that concern, noting that um, there's been a decline in volume for both PCI and cardiac surgery. For cardiac surgery, it's been about 10 years, but it's been on the decline. And I think for PCI, it's about seven years. And at the same time, the number of providers has increased. And we've added quite a number of PCI programs. And in terms of cardiac surgery, we've added one program. So um, that's part of our, our rationale behind saying that we don't think access is an issue with cardiac surgery. And then also, as I've noted here, um, historically a drive time standard of two hours has been used to evaluate the adequacy of access. And it's previously been noted with this standard that all Maryland residents do have adequate access. Um, other comments that we received on this section of the regulation, uh, MedStar commented that the impact of decreased utilization and then changes in the hospital payment policy system need to be discussed more with respect to the impact on access, quality, efficiency, and financial viability. And the University of Maryland Medical System suggested deleting language that states that the public is best served by limiting the number of programs. Um, in terms of MedStar's comments, we think that it's best to address those through a certificate of need review process for specific projects. Um, and we do have some discussion of all of those issues. In terms of um, the comments from the University of Maryland Medical System, um, 
the clinical advisory group didn't make recommendations on the optimal number of cardiac surgery programs, and we do think that um, this is a service where we want to have regional planning, and we think it makes sense to have fewer programs serving a large population base. In terms of um, the next section where we have um, program policies on <coughs> the standards related to closure of programs, both dimensions and the University of Maryland medical system asked for clarification and wanted to make sure that a cardiac surgery program would be given an opportunity to correct deficiencies before we considered closure. And the Health Senate Finance and the House Health and Government Operations Committees both seconded those comments, and so we did um, clarify the language to address that concern. In terms of the relocation of programs, um, Adventist Healthcare um, felt that a discriminatory standard was being applied for cardiac surgery programs seeking to relocate, and Dimensions in the University of Maryland Medical System suggested that the requirements could be redundant and unnecessary because um, programs would be meeting requirements for a certificate of ongoing performance, presumably. Um, but really, um, it's quite different in terms of the expectations for a certificate of ongoing performance compared to a certificate of need. And the certificate of need is really about what's the impact going to be on other programs? You know, is this a cost-effective idea? Is it financially viable? Is there a need for it? And so, you know, we don't really feel that there's a lot of overlap between having a certificate of ongoing performance and having um, a cert and having um, certificate of need requirements. Um, we did, however, you know, clarify which standards are required for relocation. There were a couple where we did think that it wasn't going to be relevant in terms of the quality standards where that was something that wouldn't make sense for relocation that would be handled through having a certificate of ongoing performance and showing that you're meeting those requirements. In terms of the certificate of need review standards for cardiac surgery programs, the minimum volume is set at 200 cases. And that is based on recommendation from the clinical advisory group. Uh, we did receive some comments um, suggesting that it should be much higher. Uh, uh, Dr. Gammy mentioned that um, it should be higher to account for um, subcategories of surgery where there's also a relationship between volume and outcomes. He specifically mentioned the aortic valve replacement. And that is a separate category where the Society of Thoracic Surgeons does track that as a, as a category for hospitals. But um, because it's a relatively small volume that most hospitals do, it's actually three years of data that they collect to then evaluate the hospital. Um, so he, he is making a good point. I'm, he's, you know, cite, he cited relevant studies. But I think that and MedStar also you know, was able to cite a study saying that, well, we think it's a little bit better if you have a higher volume. Um, but I think that it's not really enough to override the clinical advisory group's recommendations. I mean, they, did you know, specifically cite literature saying we think 200 is really the level where you see a drop off in quality. So I think we should stick with that. And this certainly is something that could be revisited in the future. In terms of the need analysis for a certificate of need, Anne Arundel Medical Center um, commented that a need analysis strictly tied to the number of diagnostic cardiac catheterizations for residents in the hospital service area that results in a referral for cardiac surgery is not appropriate. Um, they mentioned that patients were likely to go get the diagnostic cardiac catheterization at a hospital that has the cardiac surgery where they'll likely get it, and so they didn't think it would be valid. Um, the Senate Finance Committee and also the Health, Health and Government Operations Committee supported Anne Arundel Medical Center's comments, and so we did uh, revisit the need analysis section, we made some changes, and we also changed the definition of service area so that there would be more um, flexibility in, in having an applicant define its likely service area for cardiac surgery. In terms of the impact standard, um, on the first draft that we put out there, Anne Arundel Medical Center was concerned that the standard was too burdensome and that um, it basically it was tied to some quality standards that we had in there and then also a limitation on the case volume impact where uh, initially what we said is that you couldn't have a program go below 200 cases and they felt like that was um, a little bit too much in terms of, of the impact that's allowed on a program. Um, and then also Anne Arundel Medical Center and the Maryland, the Maryland Hospital Association were critical of the idea of 
looking at the impact on providers outside of Maryland. The CAG did, did recommend that only um, the impact on Maryland providers be considered. But as I mentioned, I think before, we do feel like with this service that it, it is important to look at what's going on in the District of Columbia because so many Maryland residents do go there for services. And you know, we have healthcare systems that are exist in both Maryland and in the District of Columbia, and so it just doesn't make sense to ignore that resource. And it's not really something where we can change patient decisions. I mean, we only have so much influence over where patients choose to go. Um, so we do think that the impact standard that we've included, where the impact on providers in DC is, is included, makes sense. We'd, um, we did eliminate some of the language that was seen as burdensome, and we added language to promote greater consideration of programs that are seen as good quality. I think I mentioned this at the last meeting um, where we now say that if a program is at two stars for two out of the last three um, cycles for reporting, then we give them more, you, you can't have as much of an impact on their volume as you could if it was a one-star program. And the idea is to you know, promote programs that are providing good quality care. In terms of the cost effectiveness standard, um, this is something that I also went over at the commission meeting last month, where uh, MedStar Health requested changes to the cost effectiveness standard. And they wanted to, that for an applicant to quantify the expected revenue and cost for programs and require that a program have positive net revenue. And so we revised the language describing the analysis expected of an applicant. And we felt like what they were, their comments really were getting at is that there should be a financial feasibility standard. And so that's something that we added. And, and basically, you know, I've tried to show the key points of that standard on this slide, which is they need to include the assumptions they use to develop the projections. They need to provide utilization projections that are consistent with observed historic trends, um, provide the revenue and expense estimates, and then also demonstrate that within three years or less of initiating services, that they would generate excess revenues over total expenses for cardiac surgery. In terms of the certificates of ongoing performance, there were um, concerns about program closure, um, dimensions and Dr. Hornifer were concerned that in that first draft that we put out there, there wouldn't be um, a formal review process until a program got to the point of having you know, four one-star rating. And so we did change the language to say that if a, if a program had two one-star ratings in a row, then we would um, have a focused review of that program so that there would be a, clearly a step that comes before considering program closure and doing an investigation at that point. Um, and then um, this also goes back to the first draft um, dimensions. The University of Maryland Medical System questioned the authority of the commission to require a hospital to voluntarily relinquish its cardiac surgery program. And the legislative committees did agree with that comment. And so what happened is that the legislature decided that they would give us the authority to make that make programs um, voluntarily relinquish their authority for cardiac surgery if they don't meet certain standards. Um, that's a law that was just passed, I think, in March of this year. In terms of the focused reviews, there were several comments um, that suggested we needed to add details about how, how focused reviews would be conducted, what that process would be, how plans of correction would be developed. Um, dimensions and the University of Maryland Medical System also requested that a hospital be given 60 days rather than 30 days to submit a plan of correction. Um, we added uh, a more detailed description of the process for a focused review and the development of plans of correction. Um, we really worked with people directly to make sure that the changes we were making were ones that um, they thought were reasonable and would really address their concerns. And we are still recommending that a plan of correction be submitted within 30 days, um, but we do provide extra time for a hospital to resubmit a plan of correction if the first one is not approved. In terms of the quality expectations for certificates of ongoing performance, there were some comments that expressed concern about the use of the risk-adjusted mortality rates, 
and how that would be done. So we did clarify the description of how that would be used. And the, clin the clinical advisory group did recommend using the risk-adjusted mortality rates as a way to evaluate the quality of programs. And so we think it's, it's reasonable. In terms of the volume requirement, there were some comments asking for a clarification on what would happen if a hospital performs between 100 and 200 surgery cases. If a program is below 100 cases, then we consider them for closure. Um, so, but there's not something that clearly happens when you're between 100 and 200. And, and so, you know, we do want to note that having that volume between 100 and 200 by itself would not trigger a focus review. We would look for other factors before doing a focused review. Um, but the Maryland Cardiac Surgery Quality Initiative wanted us to amend the wording to state that a cardiac surgery program should just strive to maintain a volume of 200 cases or more. But we feel like uh, we think it's important that 200 cases be the standard and not just a goal. In terms of the utilization methodology for cardiac surgery, there aren't a whole lot of changes to this compared to the current plan. I think they're relatively minor in terms of the regions and how we've redefined those. Um, <clears throat> looking at the DC residents a little bit differently in terms of not treating, treating them more like Maryland residents looking at a use rate um, as opposed to just the number in the base year and then assuming that won't change in a future year. So um, we only received a few comments on this. Um, Ann Rundle Medical Center uh, proposed using a linear regression methodology rather than an average of the year-to-year -year change in case volume. And initially, that seemed like a reasonable idea. But then um, when we thought about this again, we decided that uh, a simple methodology is probably that's easier to understand is probably better um, in terms of having everyone allowing everyone to understand it and be able to replicate it. Um, and so we are, stick, we are you know, proposing that we stick with something much simpler, you know, just that average year-to-year -year change in volume in terms of projecting a trend forward for the next six years. There was um, Adventist Healthcare expressed concern about projecting six years forward. Um, is, we think it's important to note that you know, there is a lag in the data availability, and so the projection would likely be four to five years beyond the current year. And we think that with this type of major project, it maybe makes a little more sense to have uh, more historical years to look at to kind of smooth out any changes if there are you know, sudden changes in the volume. In terms of the definitions, we added a definition for external review. This was something that we added after submitting the draft to the legislative committees. And we felt like it was important to emphasize that external review would be um, conducted independently. And so we needed to spell that out a little bit more in terms of what that meant. And so um, that means that the clinical experts who are doing these reviews should not be affiliated with the hospital or healthcare system for the cases that are being reviewed. And that um, a hospital may not have its physicians perform external review in exchange for the physicians at another Maryland hospital performing its, its external review. Um, unless such reviews are done through a commission-approved blinded system that involves you know, four or more hospitals. <laughs> Another um, change to the definitions that I want to mention is with cardiac surgery. In the draft that we submitted to the legislative committees, we included the codes that are in the current state health plan chapter for both open heart surgery and closed heart surgery, and then we added to that six codes, ICD-9 codes, that had been recommended by Anne Arundel Medical Center. And then subsequently we realized that a couple of those codes uh, for closed heart surgery actually show up a number of times at hospitals with, without on-site cardiac surgery. And so they're not really discriminating um, between hospitals with cardiac surgery and those without. And that also you know, could be problematic in terms of expanding our reach a little bit it might suggest that those hospitals need a CON to do those procedures. Uh, so in this draft, we are recommending not including those two codes, um, but otherwise um, 
the same set of codes that was included in the legislative draft. Um, and we did uh, verify that the codes provided, uh, proposed by Ann Arnold Medical Center were ones that would occur exclusively on, at hospitals with cardiac surgery. And so now I want to talk a little bit about the comments for PCI services. Um, <clears throat> on the commission program policy section, Doctors Community Hospital disagreed with the emphasis on looking at whether primary PCI services are needed in deciding whether or not um, the addition of elective PCI services should, should be allowed. Um, the hospital proposed that an avenue should be open to hospitals to meet the quality and cost effectiveness standards that meet quality and cost effectiveness standards. <clears throat> so we um, have concluded that it is really important to, to give preference to um, populations that are in need of primary health care services and that that's an important consideration and that elective PCI is appropriately viewed as an option that supports the viability of a primary PCI program. On the first draft that we put out there for public comment, um, the University of Maryland Medical System stated that we didn't include a favorable consideration for um, existing p programs that had only primary PCI services. Uh, that was something that was written into the legislation as an important element to include in these regulations. And so we did add language stating that preference would be given to existing primary PCI programs that want to add elective PCI services. Um, when there's another hospital that's also seeking to add um, PCI services and they have an overlapping service area. In terms of the certificates of conformance and the need criterion for elective PCI, Carroll Hospital Center and Doctors Community Hospital commented that the standard suggests that a hospital can't get the certificate of conformance for elective PCI unless it can demonstrate that it can't provide primary PCI without the elective services. And then also, um, Carroll Hospital Center commented that the standard is too subjective. And in terms of the, those comments about, well, you can't do primary unless you, have, unless you need elective, um, we don't think of that interpretation um, is a, is a reasonable one that the standard is requiring that the hospital demonstrate that its proposed elective PCI program is needed to preserve timely access to emergency PCI services for the population to be served. And in terms of the standard being too subjective, we do think that you know you can look at travel time analysis and patient patient data to to reasonably analyze the access of patients to primary PCI services. In terms of the certificate of conformance criteria for financial viability, there were a few hospitals that were concerned that the language allows the commission to weigh volume requirements um, if the applicant demonstrates that adding an elective PCI program would permit the hospital's overall PCI services to achieve financial viability. Um, we don't think that that um, discretion um, is, in, is inappropriate or that it would just allow anyone to very easily justify elective PCI services um, because we do emphasize in these regulations that a hospital um, has to demonstrate that access to a primary PCI services is necessary before they can go ahead and add the elective. So I think that provides a check on someone just using uh, financial reasons to try and validate that they need elective PCI services too. Um, and then I, I next want to turn your attention to the memo that I included for uh, <clears throat> certificates of ongoing performance and certificates of conformance for PCI programs, they're expected to do external review of cases. And we've included in the draft um, semi-annual review of the preceding six months of cases. And we received, initially in the first draft that we put out there, we had it as an annual amount of 5% of the cases. And then we received concerns, comments, um, from the Maryland chapter of the American College of Cardiology that that was not sufficient, that it really should be quarterly. And so we thought we looked for feedback from some other sources and it seemed like a semi-annual review was a good compromise. 
uh, we have again received a letter where they emphasize that you no, know, it's really important for um, the education of doctors and in terms of having that quality oversight and being sure that we won't have another crisis with people doing inappropriate procedures to do quarterly review. And so what we're proposing is to change the language slightly so that there would be a little bit of flexibility. The requirement is still going to be semi-annual, but it would, um, or as, as determined by the commission essentially, and so it gives a little bit more flexibility if at a later date we decide that it makes sense to have a quarterly review rather than a semi-annual review. So I included you know, the three pages in the proposed regulations where the change would be needed, and that's something that you can look at and consider. Um, I'll just mention the next steps. Um, so if we do have proposed regulations, then there would be a formal 30-day review period for public comments. And we would review those comments and present them to you at one of the monthly commission meetings. <laughs> and if there weren't major changes that were needed, then we would request adoption of final regulations. The earliest opportunity to do that would be the July commission meeting. <laughs> and you know, if the regulations were adopted at that meeting, then the effective date would be August of 2014. We're also um, going to be working on putting together the, the Cardiac Standing Advisory Committee at this point because we feel like it's important to get that up and running. Um, and there are some issues where we think their feedback would be helpful in terms of like external review and specifically what our expectations are so that we make sure that there's a consistent level of rigor among reviewers. So that concludes my presentation. Uh, I would like to request at this time that you approve uh, Comar 10 24-17 as proposed regulations, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you, Arlene, for that very detailed report. Any questions, comments? Yes. So the, the, um, thank you, it's very, very helpful. Um, the issue around the semi-annual, or at least semi-annual versus quarter, quarterly review, um, as determined by the commission. So it would be helpful to get a sense of what impact will it have on the, com first of all, how will the commission decide um, which, when it needs to be quarterly versus semi-annually? And what is the impact on um, staff and the hospital in terms of sort of leaving it open versus being clear about whether it's semi-annual or quarterly? Well, I, I think at this point they would interpret it as at least needs to at least be semi-annual, so they could choose to do it quarterly if they want to, but they need to at least do it twice a year. I think what we would look at in terms of determining if it should be quarterly is um, maybe the the quality outcomes that get reported to us, looking at like the quality review process and the results of external reviews. That's something that we can request to see. Does it you know does it look like there's a concern at some hospitals? Um, it seems like if we were concerned, then we could, you know, ask that we could potentially do a focus review if we felt like the hospital was not addressing it adequately. I mean, it was, the idea is for them to take the right steps to address the concern if they have one, and so the focus review would really just be a step we would take if it seemed like they're not taking the appropriate steps. I think mainly um, we would look for feedback from hospitals. I mean, I think we could. That's something we could ask our cardiac standing advisory committee about, and yeah. that's probably the best way to do it. If I could just yeah, echo that, but I think the standing committee is going to have a role in making a judgment on on uh, if and when we would move to more frequent reviews. Remember, I think that one thing that I've learned recently is overreach uh, can sometimes be uh, more uh, destructive than than uh, doing too little, and um, I applaud all of the commenters that have paid attention to these regulations over the last uh, two and a half years, um, and that many of them have been very thoughtful, and the uh, Maryland chapters have been very uh, persistent in advocating for uh, stringent external review. Uh, but we also have to recognize that programs are varying sizes, 
uh, that there are uh, the external review entities are, uh, are nascent in that we want to be sure they can get off the ground and uh, accomplish what they need to do. And I think I see the, the six-month uh, requirement as a transitional process that we would look at and see, uh, judge, make a judgment with the guidance of the Standing Committee on whether we wanted to go uh, for semi or quarterly reviews for everyone or developed a further nuancing for small programs, which uh, clearly more frequent reviews could have a bigger impact on smaller programs. Uh, as opposed to larger programs. So I think the, the value of the Standing Committee can't be uh, understated, that it's, it's a, a, the availability of this group to consult with Commission staff and provide advice to the Commission uh, is going to be very important going forward. Okay, since this is an action item, we need a motion for approval of Comar 102417, State Health Plan for Facilities and Services, Cardiac Surgery and Percutaneous Coronary Intervention Services as proposed permanent regulation. Is there a motion? Second. Second. Any, any other questions or discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. aye. Okay. Thank you. The proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Agenda item number five, another action item, is a change in approved project, uh, Seasons Hospice and Palliative Care Maryland, uh, Inc. with Franklin Square. Hospital. Seasons Hospice and Palliative Care and Franklin Square applied for a modification to its previously approved certificate of need to increase the estimated project cost. Kevin McDonald, our Chief of CON, will present the staff recommendation. Kevin. Thank you, Commissioner Falcone, and good afternoon, Commissioners. Um, what we have for action today is a request for a project change uh, from Seasons Hospice and Palliative Care of Maryland. This is a change due to an increase in cost above the allowable inflation factor. Um, the application was first submitted in July of 2011. It was approved in July of 2013 at a cost of $621,197. Um, at the time, there were interested parties uh, who uh, have filed an appeal for that on that, but um, that appeal has not yet been uh, dealt with. In December, the applicant submitted a request for a project change after approval, commonly known as a modification request, um, due to the cost increase, uh, primarily due to bid, uh, the construction bids came in higher than estimated. Um, there was also additional uh, IT costs. Um, for a total increase of about $450,000, which was about a 73% increase uh, for bringing the project now at an estimated uh, cost of $1,075,211. Under the Commission's regulations, a cost increase that exceeds the allowable cost inflation index uh, requires a request for modification. There are, um, in our regulations, several reasons that would trigger uh, the Commission's approval. One is a significant change in the physical design, and that is not the case here. Uh, a capital cost increase that exceeds the approved amount, and that is the reason this is before you. Um, another possible reason to bring it for you, before you would be if projected operating costs or revenue increases exceed the projected expenses by 10 percent, and that is not the case in, in this situation. Uh, changing financing mechaniz mechanisms or changing the location of the project would also trigger the need for a modification. Um, the regulations also outline impermissible modifications, and none of these fit the case. Those are, though, just for information, changes in the fundamental nature of the facility or services, uh, changes increases in total license bed capacity um, or a change that request requires an extension of time to meet the applicable performance requirements. The available actions to the committee are to to the commission are to approve the proposed changes and incorporate it into a modified certificate of need, approve the change in part or with conditions, 
do not approve it with an explanation or find that the proposed change is of sufficient scope to warrant complete review in accordance with certificate of need review process. A staff review and recommendation, although this is a, a significant cost increase on a percentage basis, um, it does not, it's not of the kind of magnitude that uh, changes the project in terms of cost and effectiveness or uh, viability of, of the project. It has relatively small impact on the cost of operating the facility over time. Uh, and th these were things that the committee commission found uh, in its initial approval. And none of these changes really fundamentally alter the finding uh, on that matter. It will not have an impact on rates to the primary payer, which is Medicare. Um, there are no material changes to the nature of the project, the location, its capacity, um, or, or change the impact on existing providers. So given uh, those findings, uh, it is staff recommendation that the commission approve the proposed modification of the certificate of need for Seasons Hospice and Palliative Care of Maryland. And I know we do have um, representatives for the applicant here. Um, in case there are uh, questions that are beyond my knowledge. You want to read those names? Sure. Have Jack Eller, who is uh, a counsel to the applicant. Uh, Andy Solberg, who's a consultant. Uh, Dean Foreman, the executive director. Josiah Linsman from Seasons. Uh, Jamie Norwood, who's the architect, and is Howard here, Jeff? Okay, he is. Howard Collins. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Okay, you heard the presentation. It's just an amendment to a CON, uh, four hundred plus thousand dollars. Any questions or comments? Yes. Kevin's uh, presentation, in my, in my view, is very clear. And uh, the, the request uh, is reasonable uh, from uh, Seasons. And uh, I, I would certainly hope that uh, we would, uh, this committee, the commission, would look favorable about, uh, on this request. Okay. Thank you, Reverend. Questions, comments? Yes, Grant. I have a question. Uh, Kevin, thank you. Um, so the situation is that because inflation outstripped the projections for the, that were made about two and a half or so years ago, that's why this modification request is before us now. Right. In a nutshell, not much is different in terms of the construction, but the inflation factor was not what we thought it would be, bumping it up above a threshold that causes them to come back, correct? I would say the situation is that the, the bids came in higher than the applicant expected or projected they would. Um, one of the factors in that might have been this was in the review process for two years. Um, right. So to my point, the, um, there's a reference here to some tool uh, that, that staff uses, the IHS Global Insight. There's some kind of a, a tool that projects what construction costs will be in the out years that is used for evaluating certificates of need. And my question is, is that, does that, do we need to rethink that tool? Are there other uh, approved CONs that are not yet built that are going to come back before us because of uh, inflation um, at variance with what the projection is? The applicant might want to speak to that, but you know, my opinion is it's not a problem with the tool. I think that um, the estimates may have been, been low initially. Um, Probably the architect is probably the best person to answer that question, you know, the person who's hands-on with that project. But I, I think the tool is fine, and you know, I don't think inflation has been really high in the construction industry. I think it was more a matter of the uh, perhaps quality of the initial estimates. Or oftentimes when you're renovating a facility, you find situations that are much different than you expected them to be. But I'll defer to the architect at this yeah, point. Howard, do you want to come up? 
and just give your name to this. Sure. Howard Tollins, Council of Diseases. Um, it, the, tool, the tool's fine. This is a renovation. What went wrong? The, um, th this is a renovation of older space, and once they broke open the walls, and it had some asbestos issues, they had other kinds of unanticipated. This project was first developed internally and starting in 2010, as, as, as Kevin indicated, uh, was submitted in 2011. So, it, so, the project, so the project budget is several years old, and in addition, there were some unanticipated construction costs. In addition, when we started looking at equipment purchases, this is co-located inside the hospital to give a seamless care delivery. So it was determined by the hospital to make that work. The computers and the call systems should be purchased through the hospital in terms of to make sure that the, the IT is compatible. And, and that's a little more expensive than when Seasons does that on its own, because they do, they've done this around the country. So in a nutshell, um, we, the, the, there are costs that just couldn't have been anticipated. And, and so we were, we were off by a bit. And they're absorbed. They're being completely absorbed. The rates aren't going to change. The patients aren't going to be affected. It's, it, is a, it is a few hundred thousand dollars that Seasons is going to have to afford. And this is Jamie Norwood from, uh, from New York. Hi. Um, as Howard was saying, the condition of the unit was in 2011, the uh, third floor of the space had just been vacated by the migration of the patient to the opposite uh, side of the campus to a new patient tower. 2011, that space was recently decommissioned. Um, two, two and a half years later, it had sat vacant. And so because of that, just a lot of age and wear and tear in a healthcare facility um, in a unoccupied unit does create drastic uh, impact on the space. And so I've got some images just of the space, if you would care to see, um, just of the space that was walking into what would be the occupied unit, um, just in terms of you know, wall protection, making sure the space looked even prepped and prepared to receive patients was a more significant understanding. Um, the last time the space was renovated, a lot of the above ceiling codes were at a different standpoint. Um, so as soon as the conditions were uh, unconcealed, a lot of things that would be required to be in compliance with Baltimore County and the um, International Energy Code, Building Code, all of these things compounded on themselves additional scope that would be needed to make the unit actually code compliant in order to get the final certificate of occupancy from the county. They've, they've, they've started the work. So this is this project is under construction, so we really need this cost increase to, to, to finish. Uh, you know, under your regulations, you, you hold applicants' feet to the fire to get your contract signed, to initiate construction, and, and so we, you know, this is, this is work in progress and we really need this. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Does that answer your questions? Thanks, sort of. I mean, it's not, I don't think it's unusual when you're renovating an old house, you find out, oops, you know, the bids were low. Okay. I, I mean, I think we, a lot of us have had that experience. That's not really novel. So I'm, I'm just trying to understand, you know, this, this, is, this is a process. I understand what we're going through. But it costs in this commission staff a, a lot of time to go back and reopen this, as it's costing you. So how can we avert this? with future, not so much with seasons, but in the future. Was the tool messed up? You said no, the tool was fine. But something in the initial bids that were put forth at the time of the initial CON well, did not take into account I, I think we can factors. do this respect to the staff. There is a percent increase that they have to bring a CON back. Maybe there should be a dollar amount. This I, okay I don't know what the these. answer is, Mr. Chair. I'm just saying this is, yeah. this is kind of a, you know, we got a lot of stuff to deal with, all of us. Uh, on our respective agendas, and, and this is a procedural necessity, but I'm just looking for ways that we could avert this kind of situation in the future, if there's something straightforward. We, we, we do a lot of this work and would, would be happy to, but there, there was, we don't have to get into it now, but there was a change at one point historically in how things were done, and, but, so we, we'd be happy to, outside the scope of this project, have a global conversation. Okay, that's fair So enough. I think, if I could just add that we are looking at changing some of our procedural rules and sort of the minimum floor, uh, as several people have observed, this is not a whole lot of money. It's um, not a lot of money, it's, but it's, it's, more, it's more time, yeah. it's the issue. Well, um, I have one question just want to clarify. I mean, the money is not a lot, but what concerned me was that the miss was so huge, 73% miss, you know, and 
then even if you were to back out the inflation and contingency, you're still looking at 64% miss. You know, uh, I'm I'm curious. I mean, a big of and the way how it's mentioned in what we have in the commissioner's report, the big chunk of that is construction costs, and it talks about upgrade and upgrade and upgrade. Is that quote related or is it really an upgrade? It's upgrade of ceiling tiles, upgrade of fire alarm, additional bathrooms. You know, so I'm I'm curious. Uh, how, what am I missing? So, it, it strikes me as like upgrade and upgrade. It's not like that's something that could have been anticipated. So my, my concern here is less about the money and more about in the future, if we were to look at this, how can we miss it by so much? So so the, you know, we, you know, the, the team takes responsibility for that. This was a, this is a very experienced provider. They used, uh, when the application was first developed, their experience in other states. Um, they're, it was a, it was a series. Of, the, the cost is a series of things. I think roughly a hundred thousand dollars or more relates to the IT computer integration, cost of integration, which was not anticipated at the time. In addition, this is a this is a unit, and, and as and as Reverend Conway really focused on in the CON review, in which this this is a short stay unit for terminally ill individuals who can't go home and are really there for very fragile periods of an otherwise terminal dying process. And so you're, you're trying to configure the space to take it from something that was used for acute care into that space. That certainly was taken into account. Frankly, it was the passage of time. The economy was in a different place a couple of years ago. The bids came in different. Uh, in addition, once, once you started opening up walls and ceilings, you encountered some things that just weren't visible, and it's a combination. This, this, this is not an effort to try and get the commission to breast some sort of luxurious, you know, the proverbial Pentagon, you know, golden wrench or whatever it was. This is something that's trying to provide the best possible environment for these patients, and uh, in a way that meets current compliance standards. Uh, it is higher than we wanted it to be, but this is something that the applicant is absorbing. It's not being passed on to patients or payers. Okay. Thank you, Howard. And I think that probably covers our comments and questions. And rather than beat the issue down, I think there is uh, a revisit to this. We, it's an action item, so we need approval to these changes. So I'll ask for a motion at this time. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. You have your change. Thank you. Kevin? So just to be clear, there was an aye on the phone. Uh, given the timing, we want to be sure we got the vote correct. Uh, for the two commissioners on the phone, you voted uh, to approve the motion. I approve, Peralta. Yeah, I approve. Correct. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you. Um, Kevin can stay with us as item number six is a CON for Prince George's Post-Acute LLC. Prince George Post-Acute applied for a CON to construct a new two-story, 150-bed comprehensive care facility, and uh, Mr. McDonald will present the staff recommendation. I'd like to introduce Bill Chan, who did the, uh, the lion's share of the work on this review, and Bill will give that presentation. Uh, good afternoon, Commissioner Falco and Commissioners. Prince George's Post-Acute seeks to construct a new two-story, 150-bed comprehensive care facility in Landover, Prince George's County. The applicant made a modification to the application on March 24th, which delayed staff bringing this application to the March Commission meeting. The original application proposed to construct a two-story, 150-bed nursing home in Upper Marlboro. The modification changed the location for the facility moving to facility approximately one mile, 0.9 miles west from the original site to Landover. The change in site increases the total projected cost of the project to $19.1 million, a difference of a little under $2 million or an increase of around 11 percent. About 750000 of this cost increase will help pay for a larger site for the nursing home. The remaining balance of $1.2 million cost increase is for changes to the design of the facility. While the relocation will include some redesign to the building to take advantage of the location and terrain at Landover, the 
facility's proposed bed size and the services offered will remain unchanged. The applicant states that the benefits for this change include the site's easier access for family and staff to Interstate 95 and 495, the consideration of more parking spaces, close proximity to a metro stop and public transportation, aesthetic enhancement to patients with a location of nearby woods and a pond, and by taking into account the slope of the terrain, the applicant will design the facility so that patients from both the first and second floors will have safer access to a larger courtyard. The applicant will own and operate the new facility. A second entity, Prince George's post acute Real Estate, will own the property and lease the building. A third entity, Future Care Health and Management Corporation, will manage the nursing home operation. Leonard J. Atman and Gary L. Atman, as well as a number of family limited liability companies, have ownership interests in both Prince George's post acute and Future Care while Alvin M. Powers only has ownership in future care. The cost to construct the two-story facil two facility is approximately $19.1 million. The applicant will finance the project with a little under $2 million in cash contributions and $17.1 million through a commercial mortgage loan. The commission projects the need for comprehensive care beds in Prince George's County by the year 2016 is 357 beds. Utilization in Prince George's County has either exceeded or is very close to 90% occupancy for the past five years. The current inventory includes 18 nursing homes, two continuing care retirement communities, and a 24-bed subacute unit at MedStar Southern Maryland Hospital Center, operating with a total of 2,841 nursing home beds. For fiscal year, Fiscal year 2012, the utilization for all 20 plus facilities was at 92.1% occupancy. Prince George's County is in the top quartile with regard to nursing home utilization by Maryland's jurisdiction. While the overall Prince George's County population is projected to grow by about 5.1% between the year 2010 to 2020, the segment of the population aged 55 years and over is projected to grow at a significantly higher rate by over 44 percent. The project will allow the applicant to provide comprehensive care services to residents who wish to remain in this jurisdiction, who may, but who may currently experience difficulty finding an available bed due to the high nursing home utilization experienced in Prince George's County. Regarding the quality of care currently provided by Future Care, Future Care operates 12 facilities with a total of 1,900 beds in Anne Arundel, Baltimore City, Baltimore, and Prince George's County. Using the Medicare.gov Nursing Home Compare website, Future Care provides a slightly above average level of quality of care at these facilities based on the CMS Five Star Quality Rating System. On average, the 12 facilities are 3.25 stars based on a five star scale and average about 10.5 deficiency, whereas the state average is 11.5. None of these facilities report having an outstanding level G or higher deficiency based on their latest standard health inspection. As to viability and financial feasibility, the applicant provides documentation that it has financial resources available, excuse me, for $2 million in equity contribution and receives interest from two commercial lenders regarding a mortgage loan for $17.1 million. The nursing, nursing home's income statement indicates the facility would generate a net profit an income of about $470,000 by the second year after opening or the first full year of operation. The applicant expects to hire a total of 136.5 full-time equivalent employees. and does not expect any difficulty recruiting personnel for the new facility. With respect to direct care staffing, the facility would deliver an average of 3.1 nursing hours per bed per day of care during the weekdays and three nursing hours per day of care during the weekends and holidays. The nursing home will participate in the medical assistance program. For fiscal year 2012, the commission calculated the Medicaid participation rate was 42.7% for Prince George's County and 44.4% for the Southern Maryland region, which also includes Calvert, Charles, and St. Mary's County. To summarize, 
Prince George's post acute has demonstrated the need for the establishment of a 150-bed nursing home in Landover. The Commission projects a need for 357 comprehensive care beds by the year 2000, 2016 in this jurisdiction. The current and historical utilization for the existing 20-plus nursing homes has been at least 90% for the past five years, and demographically, the projected population for individuals 65 years and over is growing at a faster rate than the state as a whole. The cost of the project is reasonably compared to is reasonable compared to other similar projects, and the applicant has the resources to finance the proposal. The quality of care provided by Future Care in the state of Maryland has been above average. The staff finds the proposed project to be in compliance with the applicable criteria and standards in the long-term care services chapter of the state health plan as well as with the C1 criteria and recommends approval with the following two conditions, which are both standard conditions for a project seeking to establish a new nursing home. The first condition is, at the time of first use review, Prince George's Post-Acute shall provide the Commission with a completed memorandum of understanding with the Maryland Medical Assistance Program, agreeing to maintain the minimum proportion of Medicaid patient days required by Nursing Home Standard COMAR 10-2408. The second condition is, prior to first use review, Future Care Health and Management Corporation shall provide the Commission with information demonstrating that Prince George's post-acute has established collaborative relationships with other types of long-term care providers in Prince George's County to ensure that each resident has access to an entire long-term care continuum, including its appropriate formal transfer and referral agreement. Before responding to any questions you may have, I'd like to introduce the following representatives on uh, behalf of Prince George's Post Acute. Mr. Les Goldschmidt, who is the Vice President of Operations. Mr. Mark Koppelman, who is the CPA. Future Care. Yeah. Oh, there you go. I'm sorry. Excuse me. Andy Solberg, who is a consultant. And then Jack Eller and Howard Stalin, who are counsel. So. Thank you, Bill. <clears throat> Very comprehensive. Questions, Thank comments? Questions, comments? Um, I'm pretty close. Yeah, yeah, Ken. I have a curious question. How far are you from FedEx Field? <laughs> Very close. Okay. Yeah. So, thank you. Um, thank you both for your presentation. This is a question, I think, for the, because I'm a relatively new commissioner. I was not around last spring when it appears that the commission undertook a revision of the bed projections for nursing. Right? So that was an activity that occurred April 2013. Um, some of you are nodding because you remember. But anyway, my, here's my point. On page five of the um, summary, there's a chart that shows uh, the projected, uh, the, the current bed inventory, uh, the growth need projection, I guess, based on demographic growth and then the deficit, and then the deficit is split between uh, 204 beds that are felt to be accommodated by community-based services adjustment, leaving the net deficiency of 357. So, so here's, here's this kind of policy question. This community-based services adjustment must have something to do with the concept of averting nursing homes, keeping people at home, doing wraparound services, so that people don't need to spend time in long-term care. So can you talk a little bit about that adjustment factor and if that's something that's regularly updated? or, or so that, This is a very dynamic area um, of which I know very little. We'd like to defer to Linda Cole for that one. Hi, uh, Linda Cole, uh, Chief of Long-Term Care. Uh, the community-based, you're correct, community-based services adjustment is part of the nursing home bed need projection methodology and it does try to take into account just looking at the patient needs, some of them you would like to avert nursing home use. So we look at patients who are um, light care, continent, um, and I think it was medical, mental impairment, in terms of med uh, co cognitively intact, in terms of trying to divert some of those. So that's why it, it is a reduction to the need, assuming that some of those services can be provided in the community. When the, that need projection is updated and when the methodology is updated, we look at that. So how frequently does that happen? Um, we, we were supposed to be reviewing and updating the chapter now, so we'll be reviewing the methodology within this year. 
I, I'm just not familiar. I know that Medicaid, being the most significant payer, is doing a tremendous amount in alternative uh, for community-based care. So whether or not that changes this adjustment factor and therefore what the unmet need is, not just in Prince George's, but anywhere, I think is a relevant question when, when we have other steel and Thank you. Thank you, Linda. I have a, I have a comment more than a question. Um, and it's really no reflection of, uh, of Future Health. Is actually, it's a great organization, great reputation. I think was Employer of the Year in the Baltimore Sun for the last couple of years. Uh, but my comment, because I don't want to, I don't think we should mislead the commissioners. Not that everybody's doing that. But on page 24, you know, saying that the 3.1 hours of care that's going to be provided is 150 percent of the two hours of, of the bed code. Well, that code is 40 years old. Nobody in Maryland does two hours of care in a nursing home. So, you know, I think that just, just, should just be kept in mind. Or maybe the, the, the staff is allowed to compare it to, the, when we get presentations like this, compare it to the state average or work with state legislature to change that code from two hours to a more meaningful number. I'm not sure this will answer your question, but I know currently the Office of Healthcare Quality is working on uh, updating oh, the standard, and it will be hopefully three hours direct uh, nurse care. But they're still working on drafting, and I think they haven't initiated any action yet. But I know that they are working presently, and hopefully shortly they'll that's update that's it. That's great. That answers my question. Thank you. I hope so. OK, we have comments. I have a, this is an action item, so we need approval of the CON. Is there a motion to approve? So move. Second. All in any other questions? All in favor, say aye. Aye. Any aye. opposed? You have your CON. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Agenda item number seven, another action item, is uh, study components in finite pilot hospital group hospital palliative care project. Uh, Linda Cole, our chief of long-term care policy and planning, will present an update on the status of the hospital hospital palliative care palliative care pilot project and request approval of the final selection of participating hospitals. Legislation passed in 2013 requires the Healthcare Commission in con consultation with the OHCQ and the Maryland Hospital Association to establish a pilot palliative care program and report the findings from the pilot to the General Assembly. So Linda and you're on. Okay. Um, thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. I will provide an overview and some background, and Rebecca will focus on how the data collection efforts uh, address the questions raised in this legislation. And we'd also like to thank Paul Parker for his guidance on this component of the project. As you may recall, we provided an overview of House Bill 581 um, that was uh, offered during the 2013 legislative session in November. We're now providing an updated status report and will ask for your approval of the final hospital selection. In addition, staff is seeking your review and approval of the study components and approach. A study design outline was mailed to you as part of your packet. As a brief background, this bill requires the commission to work with the Maryland Hospital Association and the Office of Healthcare Quality. The commission must select at least five pilot hospitals with 50 beds or more in a manner to ensure geographic balance. Pilot programs, according to the legislation, must collaborate with community providers, gather data on cost savings, access, and patient choice, and report to the commission on best practices to be used in the development of statewide standards. The commission's report to the General Assembly is due December 1, 2015. This describes the request for application process. Staff conducted 15 phone interviews that covered 19 palliative care programs. And this will be referred to later as the MHCC survey. As part of the request for application process, 14 applications were submitted, nine, three of which were assessed as not meeting minimum criteria. So we started this project with 11 hospitals. One hospital, Union of Cecil, decided not to participate after the initial advisory group meeting. These 10 hospitals represent the current participating pilot hospitals. And as you can see, they vary in size and geographic area. 
After the initial survey and request for applications, this has been the process to date. The Hospital Palliative Care Advisory Group was formed and held its initial meeting in December. Membership includes the Maryland Hospital Association, the Office of Healthcare Quality, the Hospice and Palliative Care Network of Maryland, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, Hospital Palliative Care Researchers, MedCi, and the 10 pilot hospitals. The group has met three times. In addition, we found that subcommittees would be helpful and we established them to address specific components of the legislation. These include definitions to address discharge data and flagging protocols for data collection, standards to consider best practices, out of hospital data to review the issues of data collection, post-hospitalization, and satisfaction to address the use of satisfaction measures and surveys in palliative care. So far, the definition subcommittee has met to help launch the data collection effort. Most of our work to date has focused on the issues and questions raised in the legislation and how best to collect data to answer those questions. To address this, I will now turn it over to Rebecca. Thanks, Linda. Um, to answer the first set of questions, we'll compile information from existing resources for an environmental scan of palliative care programs across the state. So we'll use information from pro um, the programs themselves that they've given us, our survey, the Office of Healthcare Quality, and another DHMH initiative at the Cancer Collaborative to answer how many programs exist in Maryland hospitals. In that same vein, uh, we'll delve a little deeper into the structures and operations of these programs using some of the same sources, plus another annual survey conducted by the Center to Advance Palliative Care. This is a national advocacy association. Um, the next question we'll look to answer is one that requires more primary data collection and analysis by us. Uh, using the existing HSCRC inpatient and outpatient databases, We'll look at the in-hospital patient experience. To do this, the palliative care pilot staff at each hospital will flag their patients in the database for one fiscal year. Um, the database includes demo, uh, excuse me, demographic information, diagnostic information, and use and charge data. The pilot hospitals have also conducted some of their own research on a number of topics that will certainly look into rolling into the analysis of the patient population that we're looking at. So we also need to recognize that patients receive care outside of the hospital setting. Um, our report acknowledges, will acknowledge this, certainly, um, and we're currently conducting searches for studies on this topic. However, it looks like this is going to be the biggest challenge for us. Existing literature already indicates that this type of analysis is not, um, has not been conducted in, uh, in a substantive way. We've spoken with the managers of the HSCRC databases and the all-payer claims database here to try to link the claims data with the patient experience data. Um, first, unfortunately, this is not something that can be done at the moment. However, fortunately, um, since we're not the only ones that certainly would find this information useful, they have plans to add a master patient identifier to the all claims database that would enable us to make leakages in the future. Um, that's planned for some time in 2015. Um, and as you know, the report is due in the same year of 2015, at the end of the year. So if this number or an, an identifier and uh, linkage is available by the time that we um, write and conduct our study, we'll look forward to using this. Using use and charge data will help us develop the conclusions about the impacts, benefits, and costs of the palliative care programs. We'll also look at other ways to measure and report on benefits, including satisfaction surveys, which are currently conducted by a number of our pilot sites. And finally, along with pilot hospitals and our advisory group, we'll develop recommendations for best practices and standards using data from uh, the MHCC surveys and research, as well as an assessment of national certification standards. We've assigned a subcommittee, as, Le as Linda mentioned, um, including our advisory group members, to focus on addressing this assessment. Um, those are, so the six, five or six questions that we just went over are the main questions that we'll address based on legislative language, as well as guidance from our advisors and leadership. 
and I'll pass it back to Linda for the wrap-up. Thanks, Becca. Sorry. <laughs> this summarizes where we are now. This is still a work in progress. Um, as we have mentioned, we've selected the hospitals and we're beginning the data collection for inpatient care from both CAPC, the Center for the, um, to Advanced Palliative Care, and the HSCRC Discharge Database. The other components discussed will be developed and we can keep you posted with periodic updates. We ask that you approve the final selection of participating hospitals and seek your review and approval of the study components and approach. We'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Okay, thank you. And then Rebecca, questions, comments? Yes. I'm, I'm extremely interested in the component of this, looking at patient experience of the care, uh, both within the hospital and then care <coughs> provided um, outside the hospital. Um, to what degree is the information, um, is it, is it intended to be solely collected by the commission, or is this a collaboration where the hospitals are collecting some of this information as well, in terms of the assessment of the, the patient experience? It's a collaborative process, and um, we've had some discussion about patient satisfaction. Um, there are patient satisfaction surveys that are done within the hospital, but those really describe the hospital experience, not specifically palliative care. One hospital who's a member of our advisory group has mentioned that they have developed and used specific satisfaction surveys for palliative care. So that's something that working with the subcommittee and working with the 10 hospitals will try to work on and see if we can implement that. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, there are a couple of questions on the hospital cap that specifically deal with pain management, but it doesn't necessarily zero in on uh, which patients uh, were in palliative care and how they responded to those questions on the HCAP survey. Uh, but there are several uh, there are several other types of patient experience, which is different from satisfaction, but patient experience uh, measures that um, are being used and have been um, uh, endorsed not too long ago by the National Quality Forum. I can send that information to you so you okay. can look at those. That would be helpful. The, uh, the, the goal, hopefully, would be to not create a one-off assessment. Uh, but to the degree that either questions could be used or approaches that are also parts of other surveys, so that you can start to do some comparison benchmarking, um, that would be that would be certainly my preference. But not a, a unique uh, survey instrument or approach is only used if you cannot find something already in existence that meets your needs. Any other questions, comments? Or what? Yes, Kenny. Just to uh, pick up on what Commissioner uh, Stolen will mention, I don't know much about pain management, but I understand it's somewhat of a team-based approach. So how do you expect the hospitals to work with you know, other non-hospital facilities? Is that going to be considered as part of the study? Or I mean, presumably going to come with some best practices. And then maybe the hospital could be the hub, but then there's also some other providers or, you know, practitioners that maybe, say, if they chose Hopkins as one of the, the 10 uh, pilot hospitals for this. But what if, uh, then after that, depending on the uh, where that patient is in, in terms of the, uh, the affliction, you know, they may need a different provider. How does that all work? Are you, is the study going to look at that too or no? The legislation focuses on the inpatient hospital experience. Obviously, that's only a small component of the whole continuum of care. Um, as Becca mentioned, we're trying to look at the outpatient also. And several hospitals have done their own studies of what is um, happening with their patients. So we will try to look at the literature and look at the hospitals. I don't know if you Yeah, want so to the legislation it. also requires all of our pilot sites to work with quote unquote community partners. Um, so they have all attested that they do that to varying levels and degrees. Um, well, m most of the surveys that I referenced, the um, Center for Center to Advance Palliative Care survey does ask specifically about what types of community partners do you work with and how do you work with them. Um, we'll follow up uh, and ask those 
same questions. So we'll certainly get at that from a program perspective. Um, I don't know about patient level data that we have available for that type of information, but on a program level, we'll absolutely answer those questions. We'll look at how it works in different areas of the state. We'll look at how it works for different sizes of hospitals, types of hospitals, things like that. Yes. yes. So recognizing the focus of the legislation and if inpatient, will you at least be able to collect descriptive data of their community partners to know to know which of those programs are more uh, compatible with the model that the hospitals have set up? Because I think it's really it would be a tremendous missed opportunity if we don't at least get something about the community providers into this project. But, yeah, I think that well, absolutely included description of those partnerships that exist around the state of Maryland, um, not only for our pilot but, hospitals. Right, but, but that would be, if I'm understanding correctly, from the perspective of the hospitals. I think if we can get it from the perspective of the community providers themselves uh, as part of this, so we can look at both sides of it, even though you're not going to be able to measure, if I, if I understand it correctly, sort of the activity in the, uh, the ambulatory environment. Yeah, thank you for that insight. I think that's excellent because this is not just a silo anymore, and that's the point he's making. The other point, very simple question that I had, is I dug around and I looked up, but I don't know who the 10 hospitals are. Oh, I'm sorry. It was on. I'll, get, I'll go to the on slide. On the slide? Think, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I went sorry. by quickly. Oh, oh, there. Oh. <laughs> 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 Got it. Thank you. Um, yeah, th thank you for that uh, suggestion, so Commissioner Barr. Um, we, some of the hospitals do, do satisfaction surveys with providers, so we'll look at surveying the providers, community partners, things like that. Yeah, any, anything you can get recognizing the limitations mm -hmm. will be very helpful because, yeah. as you said, you're, you're, this is new ground. And to, to go through the whole of this effort and, and miss that part of it would, would be a shame. So it would be great because I think a lot of folks could learn from what you're setting up. Yes. Thank you for your presentation. The variability of what is being offered in each hospital that is labeled palliative care, will there be a way to standardize or at least look at, is it an interdisciplinary approach? Is it available 24-7? Is it, there's such variability, how will that be taken into account? Um, thank you. It's, it's interesting that you mentioned that because from the beginning when we started surveying the hospitals, obviously palliative care is still in its formative stage. and differs uh, quite a bit from one hospital to another depending on the hospital, the community resources, how large it is, um, its integration with hospice in some areas more than others. Um, the hospitals will be flagging the patients that they consider palliative care in the hospital. We'll also be looking at the discharge status as to whether that patient accepted palliative care or did not accept palliative care or was referred to hospice. And we will have from the discharge database the, the patients that that hospital serves. So um, it's partly descriptive, as we've said. It's partly from these sites, both the CAPC and the HSDRC. So that will give us a picture, at least an initial picture, because there's very little out there now to even describe what exists. I, I, uh, I, don't, I don't remember hearing it or reading it. What percent of people pass away in the hospital? How many people die in the hospital? Yeah. No, we can get that for we'll, you, but I don't have We'll that. look into the data. It's so certainly something that I, I, is available. I think that I wanted to just make the point that we don't want to lose sight of the fact that the goal of this pilot is to develop uh, recommendations for the uh, General Assembly uh, for the development of standards for these programs. So I think uh, I would, one point that Linda mentioned was there would be a there is a subcommittee on standards. I think uh, from the my participation, there's a great deal of variability as Linda observed right now. And part of the goal is to try to hone to find something that is uh, consistent uh, and valuable for patients going forward uh, that could serve as guidance to the legislature. But ultimately, uh, the Office of Healthcare Quality, which would have probably the core um, ongoing oversight of, of, a, of a program should legislation be adopted, which I, I think there's a good deal of enthusiasm in the SM, General Assembly for, for, for taking action. And I think this pilot was a, was a mechanism to gather and inform the General Assembly on what they ought to do. Uh, 
So I think it's going to be very valuable to uh, Commissioner Barr's point on the community-based providers. I think uh, we recognize that the AP, the all-payer claims database, the medical care database, uh, would have been uh, a vehicle through which we could gather a more comprehensive information uh, on services provided in the community. I think right now the major limitation is how fast we can move forward with this master patient index. And uh, the stalling point here is financing, that we, uh, in 2015, uh, will be somewhat limited in our budget. We're looking at other avenues currently in terms of some uh, additional general funds. The Health Care Commission is special funded, but uh, should there be some available, uh, we would prioritize uh, the acceleration of that, which may uh, further support this initiative going forward. But right now, that's a major limitation. Okay, thank you. Um, so this is an action item, so we need the motion to approve the program design and the selection of hospitals. So move, second. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Approved. Thank you. Thank you. Agenda item eight, uh, Comart 102515, Management Services Organization State Designation, Proposed Permanent Regulation. So this is another action item. Uh, Sarah Orth, the Chief of Health Information Technology, will present proposed permanent regulations that apply to the state designation of management service organizations, MSOs. They were established in Maryland to support the adoption of electronic, electronic health records among community providers. MSOs receive funding to support EHR adoption through the Office of National Coordinator, National Coordinator Regional Extension Center, REC grant. This grant has been extended through the spring of 15. After 2015, our expectation is that MSOs will be self-sustaining. These proposed regulations provide the framework for recognizing MSOs that intend to, intend to operate after the federal funding ends. So, Sarah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Today I will present to you proposed regulations to modify the MHCC MSO state designation program. For the newer commissioners who haven't been on the commission since 2009, there was a law that was enacted that required the commission to designate management service organizations to offer services throughout the state. MSOs are entities that provide technology and consultative services to healthcare providers as they adopt electronic health records. MSOs provide the IT support that typically office staff, uh, physician practices, and long-term care facilities don't have um, in-house. To achieve MSO state designation, MSOs must be accredited and receive national recognition and meet over 94 criteria related to privacy and security, business practices, operations, and others. This is a voluntary program and it benefits both the MSOs as well as the providers. It ensures that the MSO entity has met industry best standards and provides that recognition so that providers can understand what the MSO is. Since October 2010, state-designated MSOs have signed up over 1,800 primary care physicians to work with an MSO. They have also helped over 1,300 primary care physicians adopt and implement an electronic health record using advanced functionality such as e-prescribing and quality reports. And they've assisted about 942 primary care physicians in achieving meaningful use and receiving an average federal incentive payment of about $16,000. More recently, two MSOs have worked with three long-term care facilities to help them adopt and use services of the state-designated health information exchange, CRIS, and integrate <coughs> clinical systems that they had in their facilities. MSOs were conceived of to help providers overcome the challenges associated with electronic health record adoption and use. MSOs offer hosted or cloud-based EHR solutions, and generally all technology is becoming more virtual these days. There aren't very many electronic health records that are sold as a client-server model anymore because it takes a lot to maintain the hardware on site, uh, including Back, maintaining the backup and security, and physician offices typically don't have that professional IT expertise on staff. So moving to the virtual model um, makes more sense, and it keeps costs down at the practice. MSOs also offer other services, including 
uh, workflow analysis, integration with other IT systems, connectivity to the state designated health information exchange, achieving meaningful use, and extracting reporting quality metrics for programs such as the patient center medical home. Staff reconvened the MHCC MSO State Designation Advisory Panel, that's quite a mouthful, <laughs> to review the requirements for MSO State Designation. As technology evolved and changes, we wanted to make sure that MSOs were offering services to keep up with that and make sure that they were meeting uh, the industry best standards at the time. One of the goals of reviewing the criteria at this time were to ensure that MSOs were offering additional services beyond just EHR adoption. There are other types of technology that uh, providers need to use, such as health information exchange and telemedicine. Um, so we worked with the MSO advisory panel and came up with some criteria to ensure that MSOs are well positioned to offer health IT services to assist practices in achieving practice transformation and in consistency with health care reform. Uh, the panel recommended that the state designation requirements allow for flexibilities for MSO to demonstrate compliance with federal and state privacy and security laws either through the national accreditation or through an independent third-party assessment. So the replacement MSO state designation regulations, if adopted, expand the definition of an MSO from an organization that offers an EHR to include other types of health information technology. The recommended changes to the regulations also include clarifying the procedures for MSO state designation. And lastly, the regulations add a procedure for commission review if an applicant for state designation disagrees with the staff decision related to their state designation status. So staff recommends that the commission adopt COMAR 1025-15 as proposed permanent regulations. If adopted by the commission, staff anticipates that presenting we would present the regulations for final action at the July 17th commission meeting with public comments that would be addressed. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have at this time. Thank you, Sarah. Questions, comments, Sarah? Yes, that's correct. Sarah, great presentation. I, I have to admit, when I first saw MSO, I was thinking about the management services organizations with the managed care days. So as I read through this, I was like, wait, this is just technology. Where's everything else? Um, <laughs> so so um, now that I understand it, could you just, what would be some names of organizations I might be familiar with in Maryland that meet this current designation? Sure. Actually, there's a list I have here in the appendix. Several are hospitals, so, um, like Greater Baltimore Medical Center, Frederick Regional Health System, providing uh, those IT consultant services to their practices in their areas. Um, and then there are some others that are new business startup companies, um, such as Zane Networks and Wavelength Information Services. Excellent. Thank you. That helps immensely. You're welcome. So, Sarah, Mr. Chairman? Yes, Dr. Go ahead. I, I would like to ask a question about um, to expand. Uh, you mentioned to expand services or services offerings beyond the EHR. And since we discussed at length uh, telehealth at the last meeting, can you offer some, um, you know, some clarity of that or perspective about what is the meaning of this and how we could advance um, telehealth using, uh, you know, the MSO services or future sure. MSO services? Sure. So at a baseline, we wanted to ensure that MSOs would be able to offer those types of services. Uh, the criteria are included in the packet, and um, so I think that we'll see those services evolve over time based on the services that their clients need. Several of the MSOs are on the telemedicine task force, so they are participating with us in those use cases. And, and this recent little grant does require MSO participation, is that correct? Correct. The telehealth pilot, exactly. Okay. Great. Thank you. If there's no other questions or comments. This is a proposed permanent regulation, so action is needed to approve that. I'm going to ask for a motion. Move second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Hi. Thank you very much, Sarah. Approved. Just a so point of clarification yeah. for our new commissioners. Uh, these are proposed regs. There is a promulgation process. These will be returning probably in uh, July, June, uh, for final adoption if we don't get any comment. Okay. Thank you. Agenda item nine is the legislative wrap-up. 
Aaron Dorian, our Chief of Government Relations and Public Affairs, will provide the wrap-up for the 2014 session. Aaron. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Commissioner. Um, I understand that I'm the last one between you all and adjournment, so I'll make this as quick and painless as possible. Um, today we will go over legislation from the 2014 session that will impact MHCC's uh, duties and responsibilities over the next year and beyond. You have two documents in front of you. The first one is the presentation that you see up on the screen, and then the second one is a chart which you can review um, in your own spare time, which I know you all have a lot of, of all of the legislation that we talked about this session, some of which is not covered in this presentation. The first piece of legislation I'd like to talk about is um, Senate Bill 622, House Bill 1233, um, Health Insurance Step Therapy or Fail First Protocol. Um, this legislation represents a compromise between payers and providers to address concerns about step therapy pro protocols raised by providers. The legislation started from some of the recommendations in the Commission's report on step therapy, which was delivered to the General Assembly in January. The final legislation creates a framework for grandfathering if a prescriber can provide supporting information that the drug was effective in treating the, the patient. It also requires payers to include a step therapy override process in the prior authorization electronic systems, which some uh, payers already are doing. MHCC will continue to work with MedCI um, and to diffuse the prior authorization system usage in, uh, provider, um, in provider offices. The next piece of legislation to talk about is um, SB 646, House Bill 1253, um, State Health Plan, Licensed Hospice Program, Certificate of Need Review. This piece of legislation was ultimately withdrawn. Um, it would have required an additional step when determining need for hospice services in the State Health Plan. However, a non-statutory compromise was reached. Um, MHCC agreed not to accept uh, new Certificate of Need applications until 2016 and MHCC will convene a work group um, which consisting of stakeholders from Baltimore City and Prince George's County to develop strategies and monitor the use of hospice services in these jurisdictions. Um, the compromise was supported by the committee chairs in the House and in the Senate. Uh, I won't go over this piece of legislation too much since you talked about the regs today, but Senate Bill um, 891 uh, MHCC Authority of Acute Care Hospitals to provide PCI voluntary relinquishment uh, puts into statute MHCC's authority to require hospitals to agree to a voluntarily relinquish authority to provide cardiac surgery and an alliance oversight of cardiac surgery um, and PCI. It's the final piece of legislation needed to implement the clinical advisory group's recommendations. House Bill 779, MHCC Healthcare Provider Carrier Workgroup passed with amendments. It establishes a standing workgroup to deal with issues between providers and carriers, such as prior authorization, step therapy, and any issues that may come up where um, another state where another where another state agency does not already have jurisdiction. Um, the first report is to be submitted January 1st, 2016. Um, House Bill 1235, Community Integrated Medical Home Program, passed heavily amended. It creates an advisory body to make recommendations on a community integrated medical home model that can be adopted statewide. Um, MHCC is working with the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to convene and staff this work group, and the report is due on or before October 1st, 2015. Um, the last piece of legislation I'll just briefly mention is Senate Bill uh, 335, House Bill 298, Health Services Cost Review Commission Powers and Duties, Regulations of Facilities, and Maryland All-Pair Model Contract. This gives our, uh, sis our sister commission, HSCRC, authority needed under the new um, All-Pair Waiver approved by CMS. Um, one other thing that I want to mention is that our piece of legislation that I, I did not put in here, but um, we did uh, bring before the General Assembly House Bill 105 our grants legislation, which gives MHCC the authority um, to give out grants uh, passed with amendments. So we were very happy about that. Are there any questions? Questions, comments? Thank you, Erin, for your work this year on all that. Yeah. Thank you. It was wonderful working with all of you, and I look forward to next year. Uh. <laughs> We'll write that down. <laughs> so, I, so I did, I 
also wanted to note uh, there will be uh, work as a result of legislation passed, uh, sitting through innum innumerable uh, sessions uh, and <clears throat> talking to provider groups. It was very clear that we have work to do on the prior auth uh, initiative that we launched uh, several years ago. Awareness is pretty low, and uh, I think working with uh, MedCi and other provider groups uh, over the over the recess period um, and consistent with the step therapy legislation, uh, we need to to make sure that uh, prescribers in particular understand that there's an avenue uh, through which they can uh, get prior off and step therapy overrides uh, approved without going through the long standing uh, hold on the phone uh, processes that everyone uh, bitterly complains about. Um, and clearly there are some challenges. All of the carrier systems are a bit different, but awareness is pretty much lacking is our conclusion. Uh, the provider payer uh, work group, which uh, was a piece of legislation Sec uh, Chairman Hammond was very enthusiastic about. Uh, we are concerned about resources if that actually took off. And uh, one thing we are fortunate is our one, a former chair, uh, Dr. Moon, uh, does serve on a group out in California, uh, the California Health Benefit Review Program uh, that, impl that engages uh, academics to, uh, to conduct studies on the cost of benefits, the value of different uh, protocols, et cetera. Uh, those are all, of course, through the, through the higher uh, education system in California, but we are going to be talking with Dr. Moon about whether she thinks such an idea could be employed by the commission to get some free resources to look at some of these benefit, uh, largely benefit questions. It's not uh, Chairman Hammond envisions other issues would be taken before that, but uh, some additional resources to the commission because, uh, as you saw today, uh, most everyone's uh, pretty much engaged. Uh, it was uh, very, very uh, heartwarming to me to see that even if the person at the table doesn't know the answer, there's someone in the room that does. Uh, so uh, we hope to keep the commissioners very well informed, but we're pretty much all operating at 100% capacity. So we're going to have to think imaginatively uh, going forward. The grants legislation, I think, is going to give us some flexibility, not from our own budget, but but to aggressively pursue some federal funding opportunities that would then be dispersed among largely what I hope would be community organizations that would benefit from the, uh, from the commission able to win additional awards. If, if I could uh, just one successful piece of legislation that I don't think was on Aaron's radar screen, but that did pass, and that's actually the governor signed the day after Sine Die as an emergency bill. It's one that addresses barriers to access uh, to care for people who, uh, patients who perceive themselves to be endangered if the explanation of benefits from the carrier is sent back home after, after the visit to the policyholder. So this could be domestic violence victims, this could be patients seeking any kind of behavioral health, this could be adolescents or now young people up to the age of 26 on their parents' policy who are going for reproductive or other kinds of, of, of medical treatment. So there was a very broad coalition um, of consumers and of various kinds of, of advocates uh, who testified in support of the bill, and it was it passed unanimously with Senate Bill 790 uh, through the Senate and then likewise in the House, and it was signed into law. So um, it's, it is a, it's not a, necessarily a breakthrough piece of legislation until the providers uh, and the community at large are aware of it and, and use the standardized form that the MIA will be preparing um, to activate that kind of a reroute on the EOB. So I just wanted to mention that. Yeah, good. Thank you. If there's no other uh, items, I'll ask uh, Glenn for a motion to adjourn. So move. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Have a good day. Thank you all. Thank you. <laughs> we'd, we'd sit here. We'd stay here. I know. I know. It was bigger you'd eat the salt, right? Whatever, yeah, whatever the portion is, right? Everybody ate what they were doing. Everybody all went in the
Kathy has to Kathy has to